So moved, Leonard. Second by Suda. Is there any discussion? Okay, Matt. Aye. Lisa. Aye. George. Aye. Joanne. Aye. Tracy. Aye. Laverne. Aye. Aye. All right, we'll move on to uh, item three announcements. Item 3.1, student uh, representative announcements. Stay on tonight. I don't think I see her on. Okay, understandable. So we'll move to item 3.2, superintendent announcements. Dr. Harden. And who is running the, the slideshow deck? That should be showing now. Believe that it is Mark that is. Yeah, I'm trying to get this. I don't have access to it right now. Um, I'm working with Nancy to get access to that to show it. I don't know if Candace has access to it or not and can show that, but. Um... Okay. We're working on it. Okay. Okay, so um, nearly, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, nearly eight months away, nearly after eight months away from school buildings, we will welcome our youngest students back for in-person instruction on Monday, October 19th at um, Julia Goldstein Early Childhood Education Center. Staff, administration, and parents are informed and they are ready. Our preschoolers will start um, an in-person instruction model in our hybrid. Um, on Monday and Tuesday or on Thursday and Friday. And we will, uh, some of them will continue the virtual instruction in all virtual model. The days that they are not in school, they will still have access to virtual instruction. We cannot wait to welcome them back. This is all part of our pledge to adapt to a COVID-19 model of in-person instruction that is safe, gradual, and kind. Um, we did make this decision after reviewing city and regional metrics, also consulting with the St. Louis County Health Department and several excellent pediatricians. We were able to have two of them um, working with our um, staff on Wednesday, yesterday, Dr. Katie Plax and Dr. Jason Newland from Washington University um, served as a panelist for about 370 staff members via webinar and they, their topic was on COVID-19 and ways that we can reduce transmission and also um, try to prevent the spread of the virus. As we look ahead, we are excited to host a um, socially distanced outdoor pumpkin stroll for all district staff, students and families on Saturday, October 24th. Um, we hope to have as many as 800 carved pumpkins lit around the high school stadium track. And we do need your help. So you'll look for more information about how you can carve that pumpkin. Uh, costumes are encouraged and safety masks are required. I wanna give several shout outs to many innovative lessons and activities that are underway by our teachers and staff during this difficult time. We had kindergartners working in our gardens at Pershing Elementary School. We also had student yoga. Our students are learning to be um, yoga um, facilitators at our middle school in the courtyard. Our high school Black Academy is engaged in a safe outdoor uh, service project to rejuvenate a courtyard at the high school. And our high school and middle school students have been participating in a highly relevant STEM instruction um, activity with Washington University School of Medicine researchers who are working on the front lines of COVID-19 prevention and vaccines. Tomorrow, um, 12 of our high school students will be on site working with one of those researchers to learn about the process involved to create a vaccine and just really understanding more about the global pandemic, COVID-19. Finally, on last Friday night, the high school under the leadership of our amazing principal, Mr. Peoples, and our ELA and social studies instructional leader extraordinaire, Christina Sneed, um, we had an outdoor screening of student documentaries that were inspired by the 1619 Project. I was unable to attend this event. However, I heard that the students' work was sharp, professional, and provocative. 
all the things that embody learning reimagined. Many thanks to the University City Education Foundation who funded the purchase of a 24 foot outdoor movie screen and projector, which I'm sure we will put to good use for many, many years to come. That concludes my announcement. Okay, thank you. Item four point, I'm sorry. Uh, item 3.3, .3, School of the Month, Julia Goldstein, Early Childhood Education Center. So we are very um, fortunate to have um, our Julia Goldstein team here. I think it's fitting that they're the first to start back in person and they're here as our School of the Month. So I will turn it over to uh, Principal Kali and she has some of her um, teammates from Julia Goldstein who will be presenting with her. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Veronica. Good evening to the University City community, Dr. Harden, and members of the board. It is my pleasure to be with you this evening, representing Julia Goldstein, the School of the Month. Presenting me, with me tonight are two fabulous JG educators, Ms. Fanny Bill, our creative arts teacher, and Ms. Dawn Pulsifer, our studio teacher. With the current challenges we face, Globally, nationally, and in our communities, we realize just how important it is to have strong leadership as we work to solve problems humanely and thoughtfully. Dr. Harden, we appreciate your strong leadership at this critical time. Tonight, our goal is to show you how Julia Goldstein is shaping tomorrow's leaders. Next slide. Do we have the PowerPoint deck for Julia Goldstein ready to go? Thank you. I think she's ready for the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> we, we will provide examples of how our regional inspired approach supports the district's mission of reimagining learning. The work that we do at JG allows our children to participate in child centered, individualized, and enriching learning experiences, providing space to think and create at high levels. Next slide. This is our staff. At Julia Goldstein, the process of learning begins with us. We are the lead learners with the primary responsibility of guiding students through a journey of discovery, promoting self-expression and inquiry. Next slide. Resu Inspired Learning is all about making learning visible. We have slides tonight to share with you that will provide you with a glimpse of the amazing work that our children produce at our school. The primary tenet of Regio Inspired Learning is that the philosophy is that all children are competent, curious, capable, and creative. These key characteristics are visible in the images of our children. Next slide. As a result of our planning, listening, observing, and guiding our children and to construct knowledge for themselves and engage deeply in meaningful content. So, next slide. Well, that slide, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. This is an example of project documentation that you might see on our walls. This documents a STEAM project called Preschool Physics in which children designed and built marble ramps and conducted other studies with motion. Next slide. In 2015, we started a project to learn how to work in the Reggio way. In the Beautiful Stuff project, families were asked to help gather recyclables Children brought back their treasures, odds and ends, jewelry, ribbons, pine cones, leaves, and beads. Our goal was to collect loose parts. These are motivating materials which encourage children to organize, design, sort, and play. It was our way to research children's thinking. Next slide. This picture shows students working on a giant lion mosaic, which still hangs in our multi-purpose room. With their beautiful stuff, this class asked for all black and yellow or gold items. Next slide. Oh, we're missing that slide. We could go back one. <laughs> uh, they did every step of this project, spackling the items, mixing the mortar, figuring out the design, and literally never got tired of it. For us, it was a project that shows children's capabilities. Next slide, please. In 2016, we were awarded a substantial grant from PNC Bank. This funding we received provided us the means to purchase literacy resources for our families to use at home and to host events that promoted parent-child interaction while supporting vocabulary development. We were actualizing another element of the Reggio inspired approach, which is the belief that parents are the co-learners just like our teachers. 
Our literacy events were well attended. As we reflected on those events, we realized just how much our parents enjoyed coming to school, working with their children. So in 2017, we created the Community Word Project. The families drove this project. This word wall was a collection of words on the minds and in the hearts of our families. It began with the question, what words inspire you? Next slide. Not only did children write words with their parents and collect them at home in word boxes, but we of course wrote many words in our classrooms. We researched writing development in order to empower the voice of the child. Our children have things to say even before they can form the letters, and we know that having meaningful reasons to write gives them motivation to learn. Next slide, please. The creative arts are a great way to teach children leadership skills by problem solving, thinking independently, working together, and finding their voice so that they can speak for themselves and others. Parents help us do this by participating in various school activities. We provide the time, the space, the ideas, and resources to inspire parents to try new activities that can be done at home. These slides show some of the activities experienced by the parents and their child at our school, like singing karaoke, making percussion instruments, and demonstrating some of the beats that they learned in class on the bucket drums. Some parents even showed their musicianship by playing along. Next slide. In 2018, we were honored to work with renowned St. Louis artist, Kababi Bayak. He designed a mural for our playground based on the vocabulary words that parents generated with the word wall as representing our community. Parents, children, and teachers all helped to paint the mural along with Kababi. Next slide, please. Here is the finished mural. It is a beautiful complement to the new playground, which was gifted to us as part of the Mindful of Words initiative, the first vocabulary-inspired playground in Missouri. Next slide. So now we move from the written word to the spoken word. Every year for our winter concert, the students learn the story and the music for the gingerbread man. The gingerbread man teaches the students about making strong choices and being careful who you trust. To help them make connections and build their literacy skills, they tell the story using characters on the flannel board. They act out the story and they do sequencing by identifying the beginning, the middle, and the end. All of their hard work culminates in a one hour, highly engaged, interactive performance that, as you can see from this slide, is a well-tended, standing room only audience of family and friends. The students take the lead in this concert by designing and making their own costumes, their props, and they get a kick out of seeing their and hearing their parents sing with them as they listen and react to the story narrated by a guest storyteller from the University City community. Next slide, please. The Julia Goldstein Community Garden was started with a grant from USEF in 2018. It is a true outdoor classroom in that we integrate many different subject areas into our learning, and the children just love it all. In this picture, a class is harvesting basil for their STEAM project, which was creating recipes for Play-Doh, integrating math, literacy, science, and hands-on sensory learning. Next slide, please. The entire school community took part in this garden project. Here you see parent volunteers from our Parents Pride organization, along with their children, working one day after school to create the signage for our garden. Not only did they do that, they volunteered to work in the garden over the summer. That's great. Next slide, please. Last year, Ms. Don and I wrote a use of grant and was funded to build a sound wall on the playground. The purpose in building the wall was to inspire creativity and facilitate a hands-on sensory learning experience for the students to discover various sounds and rhythms using recyclable items. This was student inspired in all of this in that all of the decisions as to the design of the of the wall was made by them. This slide shows the students drawing the type of instruments, the percussion instruments that they wanted on the wall. You can see they even wrote the words music wall at the top. We didn't finish due to the quarantine, but we'll complete the wall sometime in the spring with the help of parent volunteers. 
Next slide, please. Partnerships in education build bridges between parents, communities, and schools. In 2019, we partnered with two community partners, the Sheldon Solid Music Program and the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra Symphony in Our School Program. These slides shows the students' participation in the Sheldon's Solid Music Program, where they designed and started to build instruments from recyclable materials. You can also see the students' sense of wonder and curiosity as they explore different ways to play the buckets and the pots and pans donated by the parents for the <coughs> sound wall. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates our work with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra Symphony in Our School program. The purpose of the partnership is to introduce and foster an appreciation of classical music to the students and their parents. Students learn to compose an ostinato, which is a musical pattern that they play on stage with the symphony at the Tiny Tunes concert. Here the students are doing body percussions with the symphony's musician to the book, The Remarkable Farkle McBride. Next slide, please. So you can see that over the years, we've learned a lot about our children and what they're capable of accomplishing. Through classroom meetings and discussions, we have also learned that our students have many ideas and questions about what is taking place in society. The events that have occurred over the last few years have impacted the adults and our children. As we began planning for this year, we wanted to allow our youngest learners to express themselves. This summer, we decided to honor their voices with the Social Justice Project. Next slide. So as Ms. Colley said, we think that this year is more important than ever that our children feel connected to each other and be able to share their voices. So we began the Social Justice Book Club. Research shows that reading good literature builds empathy. So our goal is not only to promote self-love, we also want to instill a love of literature in our students because literacy is love. The ultimate goal in the work that we do with, that, with your help is to build global class citizens by meeting the social and emotional needs of every child that walks through the door. We want students to go forth into the world as leaders that are able to problem solve, express themselves, have a healthy self image and find their voice so that they can advocate for themselves and others. We want them to be able to answer the tough questions who am I? How do I show love for myself and others? And what do I want to say? Next slide, please. We started off book club by reading books dealing with the subject of identity. Here are a few at home work samples that have connected to the concept of self as Miss Bell just described. Next slide, please. Now we're moving to the theme of voice. Voice is more than just speaking your mind. It also incorporates writing, drawing, dancing, movement, singing, and many more expressive languages. An important part of voice is being heard. Listening to the thoughts and feelings of others can be transformative. This picture shows us collaborating as a team around the subject of voice. It shows our voices coming together to bring about change. Next slide, please. Our children are learning to be confident, to be courageous and to speak up. Next, Next slide, slide, please. So ladies and gentlemen of University City, this is what we do at Julia Goldstein. We invite you to follow us closely on our self-discovery journey to become stronger leaders in our community. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Does the board have any questions or comments for uh, Julia Goldstein? Tracy? Um, I was just going to say kudos. That was a great presentation. I have twin three-year-olds next door that are super excited to be coming to school. And I got a chance to watch you all on screen when you were doing your dance, Miss Fanny. And you were <laughs> trying to get them to dance with you, which trying to wrangle two three-year-old twins was pretty impressive. So kudos to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I did look at the I did look at the presentation really quickly uh, beforehand today, and uh, uh, 
I always like to look at photographs and, and every picture tells, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. You can see in these pictures that you have in the slideshow, um, not only the, the, the work the students have done, but there's some pictures of them just showing how engaged they are. When they're sitting around a table and everybody is absorbed in doing the project, um, I love to see that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Joanne? Yes, thank you for a powerful presentation. That was really a delight. Um, as someone who taught kindergarten for almost 30 years in this district, um, it is so important to have high quality pre-kindergarten programs for our students. And I want to thank all of you for the, the work that you do every day to get our kiddos off to such a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. The other board members. All right, again, thank you so much for coming and um, we look forward to continued success at Julia Goldstein. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll move on, on to item 4.1, citizen comments. Your Board of Education is very interested in citizen input and concerns and has allotted a period of 30 minutes at the end of our board work sessions for citizens and staff to address us. We ask that remarks be limited to four minutes and that you please speak to issues. The board cannot discuss personnel matters or individual student concerns in public sessions. Citizens who wish to comment about a particular agenda item may do so during, citizen, during the citizen comment section. No comments will be made from citizens during the regular board meeting or work session. Attendees wishing to participate in the citizen comment section of the meeting must sign up in advance prior to the meeting with their name, address, email, phone number, and topic of the comment. Comments will be read during the comment part of the meeting. It is our intent to conduct our meetings in a manner that is at all time respectful to our students, staff, community members, and fellow board members. And do we have any uh, citizen comments tonight? Yes, we do. I have one com comment from Tom Sullivan, 751 Syracuse Avenue, University City, Missouri, 63130. It is regarding the stellar award for Superintendent Hardin Bartley. Given that University City Schools are still among the worst in the area, it is puzzling how Superintendent Hardin Bartley could be given the stellar award in education by the St. Louis American. What is especially concerning is that African American students do so poorly in the district. They are nearly four grades behind white students, according to a 2018 report by ProPublica, a public interest news organization. The poor academics have no doubt been a major factor in the district's shrinking enrollment down to around 2,500 and losing 100 students a year. At that rate, 20% of the current enrollment will be lost in five more years. Also, Superintendent Hardin Bartley's support for selling the McNair administration raises questions about whose interests she is serving. Thank you for listening to my comments, Tom Sullivan. We have no other comments. Okay, thank you, Candace. We'll move on to item five, consent, consent agenda. So can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda 5.1 through 5.6 as listed? So moved, Bellows. Second, Moore. And Leonard. Okay, so Bellows and then Moore? Yeah. Okay, is there any discussion? Okay. Uh, Tracy? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Laverne? Aye. George? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, we'll move on to item six, previous minutes. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the regular minutes from September 17, 2020? Motion by Suda. Second by Moore. Bernard. Sorry, Tracy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Second by Tracy. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. George? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Matt? Aye. 
Lisa? Aye. Aye. And can I get a motion to approve the special board meeting minutes from September 29th, 2020? Motion by Suda. Motion by Suda and second by Lenard. Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay. Tracy? Aye. George? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? Epstein. Okay. And I. So we'll move on to item seven, superintendent reports and recommendations. Item 7.1, reentry update. Dr. Harden? So um, thank you. This is an item that I added. It's not, we don't have any um, documents and board docs. I wanted to give the board an update. As you know, the current state of COVID-19 is changing daily. We are um, consistently monitoring our metrics to determine when it is safe to implement our safe, gradual, and kind plan. Um, we have um, conferred with our elementary principals and of course, leveraging the expertise of the medical experts, including Dr. Plax and Dr. Newland, who were with our district on yesterday. I did share, <clears throat> excuse me, that PowerPoint deck with the board, as well as a, a recording of that webinar. We had a lot of rich dialogue, a lot of candid dialogue. So we are in a position to um, begin reentry for elementary school. And I wanted to give the board an update about what that plan entails. Um, at our meeting that we had back in July, um, the board voted for a virtual start and we have progressively evaluated a return based on science and based on safety. So we are um, considering a return to school for our elementary students in November, early November. Um, we would like to eventually return all K through five students in a hybrid um, model, which would be Monday, Tuesday, or um, Thursday, Friday, with virtual instruction occurring on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, we believe for many reasons, this is in our children's best interest from a social emotional perspective, as well as from a racial equity perspective. Um, we have mapped out a timeline that will be shared with staff. That includes um, staff webinar for elementary staff, as well as a parent meeting for all parents and a survey um, determining which families would be coming back in person and those that will remain virtual. We also have built in time for our teachers to prepare for their classrooms and also to be trained on um, new safety protocols so that um, we can again ensure a safe and healthy return, not just for our students, but also for our, our teachers. We wanna make sure that we are giving them some securities of the processes that we have in place for ensuring their safety. Um, so the, the date is early November and we are prepared to execute this plan. Um, we are also having conversations with our middle school team and they will be engaging the middle school staff um, and considering a return in early November for uh, middle school as well. At this time, um, we're not considering a high school return yet. Um, Mr. Peoples is in, in close contact with many high school principals from across the area and we, we talk regularly about when it makes sense to start that transition. We also understand that our high school students um, need the social emotional supports and as well as the um, academic connections. So that is where we are um, to date. Um, and I wanted to see if the board had any questions. Sir. So oh. Uh, just really fast, uh, it says this is an action item, but this is just information, correct? Just information. Okay, sorry. Um, does someone have a question? Yes, yeah, Sharonica. Uh, we are bringing back the uh, Julia Goldstein next week, right? Yes. Okay, can you give uh, us some examples of some of the precautions that were taken in terms of the COVID-19 issue? Um, I've shared all of them with the board um, previously. 
but they include um, training for contact tracing. They include um, PPE equipment um, for staff as well as for students. Um, also includes heightened um, staffing for custodial staff. Um, there have been some improvements with um, providing disabling water fountains and providing water bottles for students. We also have um, purchased additional hand cleaning stations that are mobile for hand washing and hand sanitizing. We have a number of um, hand sanitizer stations in addition to the, the regular um, bottles that are in rooms. We have worked in tandem with our teachers to um, give them guidance on what is their responsibility. We do have some requirements under a three-step process that we are required to use at Julia Goldstein anyway. So we have just reviewed those to be sure that staff is, is aware and familiar. We have also identified additional nursing staff to work at Julia Goldstein to support Nurse Wilson, who is our lead nurse. She has served on um, task force for the state and has been guiding us as well from a um, health perspective. We will have two um, influenza or flu shot vaccination clinics on site on Thursday and Friday for district staff that is at no additional cost. Uh, we are strongly encouraging our teachers to take that flu shot, our staff. We have also provided a um, immunization or flu shot for our families and we'll have additional ones as well. And we have had, um, Crystal and her team have had several conversations and actual meetings with parents to review the procedures um, for drop off, procedures for pickup, as well as procedures for completing um, our healthcare screener, which is called 360 assessment, which is a healthcare screener that we have loaded in our CISK 12 system for um, easy access. So those are just a few things off the top of my head, but we have a very uh, comprehensive um, approach um, that we have used. It is very similar to the reentry plan that we approved in July. Um, we have just really been executing that plan. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted the public to be aware of all that is being done and all that you all are doing as well. Thank you. But you're, but you're right, you did share a lot of that with us, but I just kind of wanted it, you know, Sometimes, no problem. You know, sometimes you have to let people know. <laughs> you're right. Thank you for that, Miss Fort Williams. You're absolutely right. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I haven't looked at the uh, the metrics on the dashboard for about a week, but I've been listening to the news and nationally hearing about how. Um, it's it's headed back up in a quite worrying way, and um, the state of Missouri overall um, does not look good. Um, are things better in St. Louis County and St. Louis City than some of these other places? We would not be making this recommendation if we did not feel that the metrics were better. The metrics specifically for younger children are under 5%, in some instance at 2%. And we, are, um, we have had success with many centers that have been open since the summer, and they have been in session with minimum to no um, outbreak. Um, one of the things that we heard on our webinar with our medical experts the, the mitigating factors that we put in place will help to um, minimize transmission. That's wearing a mask. We made the very difficult decision that I didn't share because it wasn't included in the plan. All of our Julia Goldstein students will wear masks. Um, the exception is those that have a medical condition and those will be a very rare exception. We have research now that has um, meant, reduced that number. It was students age nine or older. Now it is students two and older from the CDC. So we will be providing masks um, to all of our students and requiring masks. Also, um, <clears throat> we are looking at the hand washing, washing our hands frequently, making sure that our students know how to wash their hands, making it fun um, so that they, they, they take pride in it. Also, um, some of those cleaning and sanitation rotations that we'll have in, in place more frequently as Julia Goldstein to wipe down surfaces, to clean in between um, cohorts. So, I, I want to be very um, transparent. We, we, ha we have a global pandemic. 
And so um, there are um, instances that we, we, we know that we need to be extraordinarily careful in mitigating and managing the, our response to that pandemic. Um, Crystal and her team have actually talked with um, University City Children's Center, and Crystal might be on the call still, but um, she has talked with um, University City Children's Center, who has been in session for several months. They're right here in New City about their plan and their procedures and, and their protocols. So we have learned from um, many centers that are already open and are work to replicate that. The metrics in, in, the, in the state are, are more intense. The metrics in um, St. Louis County are still, they're at a level of, that's called plateau. And so that is the level right below, right above kind of a benchmark level. Our positivity rate as of last week was 4.2%. Um, if we remember when I talked about this a few months ago, we were approaching 12%. So I think that number is um, consistently reducing. Um, and so we, we are monitoring that. One of the things that we, we will maintain, um, if we feel that the, the reopening is not yielding um, the success, or if we're seeing increases in cases in our area, we will reevaluate. But at this point, um, we are still recommending the hybrid so that we do have smaller class size and we can better respond to contact tracing if we do um, have a case so that we can again mitigate, quarantine, isolate where appropriate and effectively communicate with our families and, and our staff. And I, I don't know if you mentioned in response to Laverne's question because you mentioned a lot of things, but um, we are still uh, also looking at the cohort concept of kind of minimizing interactions between students in different classes that we would normally have like on a playground or in the lunchroom? So we will have two cohorts, cohort A, that will attend school on Monday, uh, Tuesdays, and then we have cohort B that will attend school on Thursday, Friday. Um, to accommodate exactly what you just said, to minimize the students that are interacting with each other, to help us be able to contact trace, and to help us um, more adhere to some of the guidelines for CDC for social distancing, which is now three to six feet. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a question, it's Joanne. Mm -hmm. um, so our cohort data, from what I understand, for our high school um, students is ages 15 to 19. We talked in the past about the difficulty of um, that, including high school students and college students. And of course, I'm sure some of our kiddos are working as essential workers, too. Um, is there a way to drill down that data to separate high school students out from college students? Not yet. Um, it's 14 and 19 right now, or 15 and 19. And so we have asked for the county to disaggregate that so that we can look at um, school age children explicitly. The county is not capturing the data in that way. And we get our data from the health department. Um, we're partnering with St. Louis University as well as Mercy Hospital on the dashboard and to date they have not been able to disaggregate it we just got it disaggregated by um, school age population so zero to five um, five to nine i think it's 10 to 14 and then 15 to um, 19. so at this time we don't have the capacity internally to capture it um, because our data is coming from a central source which is the county health department and that is how they're capturing it now and so I guess another source of our data is high schools that have opened, and I'm sure we're mm -hmm. watching those because that would, that would more, act, uh, more accurately reflect our cohort. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Um, there's no other questions. We'll move on to item seven. Oh, can I just close out just for just so you are aware? Then the, this communication will be shared with staff um, this evening, and then we will be sharing it with families tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, item 7.2, National Disability Awareness Month Resolution. 
So it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the National Disability Awareness, Awareness Month resolution as presented. October is Disability Awareness Month and our Board of Education is also committed to raising awareness about the month by adopting, by adopting the following resolution. Whereas there are approximately 126,000 students with disabilities educated by Missouri public schools. And whereas the Americans, I'm in a meeting, America, sorry. <laughs> whereas the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 is founded on four principles, inclusion, full participation, economic and self-sufficiency and equality of opportunity for all people with disabilities. And whereas a key method of promoting these four principles is for our school to recognize the contributions by people with disabilities to our society and provide instruction in disability history with history, people with disabilities, and disabilities rights movement through school curriculum, school assemblies, and other school activities. Now, therefore, uh, be it resolved by school board of the school district of University City that the board, of, the board urges our schools to provide intensive instruction on disability history, people with disabilities, disability rights movement, especially during the third week of October, and periodically throughout the year, and encourages other institutions to conduct and promote educational activities on these subjects. Um, can I get a motion to approve the um, NDA as presented? So moved by Moore. Second, Brenner. Is there any discussion? Okay, Tracy? Aye. George? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Aye. Item 7.3, 2020 Virtual Summer Learning Academy Program Evaluation. And so, this is, um, this is um, an item under the superintendent report that I've asked Susan Hill to share. She supported this work this year um, as we transition to an all virtual model. And so, um, Susan. Good evening. I am just going to provide a high level overview of the program evaluation that was submitted in the board packet. And I am going to start by talking through some of the major changes that we um, experienced because of COVID-19 and based on some recommendations from last summer's Virtual Learning Academy. Um, I'm going to go over some of our key objectives and give you a few um, conclusions and feedback that we'll be using to move forward. So we had quite a few changes to our Summer Learning Academy. Uh, it was entirely virtual. And we also offered more opportunities for enrichment in K through eighth grade. And that was based on feedback from prior summers where parents were requesting and we um, teachers and educators wanted to provide more enrichment opportunities for our K through eighth grade. We also made a shift um, at the high school level from the Edgenuity platform as the primary means of credit recovery and shifted to the use of Google Classroom and our high school instructors in the core content for credit recovery. Another change that we made is that we offered courses in both June and July. In the past, we have uh, run all of our courses in June and this month we spaced that out over two months. Uh, we also used the launch platform for elementary and then solely for middle school summer learning. And then some of our school district of University City teachers taught launch courses. So they weren't actually um, employed by the school district of University City. They um, were employed by Springfield Public Schools, but Springfield arranged for them to teach um, the launch courses over the summer to our University City students, which was a unique partnership. Um, another major change, Senate Bill 319 was waived by the state um, because of the need for in-person instruction that's necessary for effective uh, reading instruction and helping those students make gains with reading. We also had significant amounts of support in terms of meal distribution, supply distribution, book distribution um, that was assisted by uh, Gary Spiller and Joe Miller and their teams and Wyman who supported students socially and emotionally throughout the summer. We did experience a significant reduction in Summer Learning Academy staff compared to other summers and I'll explain why, um, but that was because of the shift to virtual and the use of launch primarily. 
And it was also very difficult um, to use benchmark assessments to measure student growth as we have done in the past in an entirely virtual format. So we did not use the Galileo platform and rather we focused on providing engaging, enriching lessons and activities in reading and math and asynchronous learning that would um, mitigate summer slide and what we call the COVID-19 slide. So that was really the first objective was um, even though we could not have students in person and many school districts made the decision to offer no summer learning opportunities, we decided that it was very important for our district to continue to offer summer learning even though it needed to be in a virtual format. And so that was one of our primary objectives. And in doing so, we wanted to mitigate the summer slide, but specifically how um, the slide that um, COVID-19 was causing to exacerbate that issue. Um, we had over 600 students take advantage of our Virtual Summer Learning Academy, um, which is about the same as we've had in prior summers. The numbers look a little different at the middle school, but we actually had more students take advantage of summer learning at the high school than we've had in the past. And also the addition of launch enrichment courses at the elementary level increased our enrollment. And if you look at the program evaluation, you can find all the specific numbers there. Again, Brittany Woods Middle School only used launch as a platform. The elementary and the high school both had School District of University City teachers as an option in addition to launch. But at the middle school, our rising sixth through eighth graders did game, uh, courses like Escape Room, Game On, which had a coding um, component to it. And with those two classes in particular, our Brittany Woods Middle School teachers taught those courses. Lots of positive feedback from family about the launch platform at both the elementary and middle school level. Our second objective, which was the most, was the most challenging objective for us, was to encourage elementary families who had not engaged during the fourth quarter of the 1920 school year to engage with Summer Learning Academy. We had um, kept close data on tier three families, so families that did not have significant engagement in quarter four. We identified those families and had um, at minimum four points of contact with those families via letter, via phone call from the student's teacher, um, email from the district and from the school administrators, and then direct contact from school administrators. And unfortunately, we did not get a significant number of those tier three students to enroll in the virtual summer learning academy um, despite those efforts. So that was a, a challenge of the program. Our third objective was to establish virtual credit recovery options for students in grades 10 through 12 that didn't rely on the Edgenuity platform. And we had a goal that 94% of students um, who would enroll, or 85% of students who, were, who enrolled would earn credit. We actually had 94% of the students who were, who were enrolled to earn credit. And we also saw a significant increase in the number of students uh, taking advantage of health, PE and personal finance on the launch platform. And students do that so that they have more room in their schedules for electives in the regular school year. So we had a, a large number of students um, to enroll in those platforms. And so our actual total enrollment for Summer Learning Academy at the high school went from 137 students to 226. So that um, launch platform for electives is becoming a much more popular um, thing for our students, which is great because we want them to be able to take as many classes as they're interested in. Um, in the regular school year as well. I am going to get back to the math data point um, towards the end of the summary just because the data there can look a little misleading. So I'll just dis I'll discuss that in a moment. Our fourth objective was to identify highly qualified staff who were interested in high quality virtual instruction. And we really wanted to see how they could develop best practices um, that could inform our work into the fall as we planned for virtual instruction and for hybrid instruction. And so all of the teachers that taught Summer Learning Academy this uh, past summer were highly recommended by building principals as teachers who are exceptionally good at fostering relationships with students and showed um, really great proficiency with virtual learning in the fourth quarter of last school year. So um, we were able to identify some really rock star teachers as we call them. And uh, they did a great job with our students um, K through 12. 
And then um, we also utilize launch, of course, so launch instructors. And then we also had tools um, like Lexia and Alex that guided students in um, asynchronous instruction as well. Um, our final objective was to approach cost neutrality to the greatest extent possible. And um, I am happy to say we were able to do that. The district only um, had a cost of $19,477 total for the Summer Learning Academy. Um, that was the difference between the cost and then the ADA reimbursement. We were able to significantly increase our ADA reimbursement last summer, um, even though our costs were about the same. We had significantly less staff with a virtual model, um, so we did not have facility assistance and other kind of roles like that that you need for an in-person um, program. And so that also helped with costs. And this was a, a dramatic um, decrease in the expenditures that we usually have as a district for Summer Learning Academy. So overall effectiveness, um, family feedback on Google Form surveys showed that they definitely enjoyed having the flexibility of virtual courses. And um, they, you know, while we were unable to engage students who were disconnected from virtual learning in the fourth quarter, the students that we had with us um, during the summer were highly engaged and we had positive feedback from families. Um, we did learn it's very important, at, especially at the elementary level to maintain a smaller student to teacher ratio at the high school level, teachers were able to support more students um, for credit recovery um, in terms of student to teacher ratio. But at the elementary level, we wound up actually adding an additional teacher after June to support through July because we had so many third and fourth and fifth grade students that we really needed an additional staff member to support. So that was a lesson learned. Similarly with middle school, students and families really gave a lot of positive feedback about the enrichment courses and launch. They loved the topics. Um, it was engaging and fun for students. And then at the high school level, um, we had increased enrollment and a very high rate of credit recovery. I do, though, want to comment on math. Um, the data there is a little misleading. Uh, as 60% of the students who had initially enrolled in the math course wound up dropping because they were hoping to return to an in-person math course in the fall. And so that is something that we're definitely um, talking through in terms of math. Um, students felt that the virtual option for math credit recovery was not going to work for them. So the students who continued with the class were successful, but so many students dropped. And so um, we just know that math is a, is a bit different than the three other subjects. And we need to find ways to support students um, in a better way with that virtual uh, part of math class. Um, so I just wanted to be transparent that that data is a little skewed um, in the objectives. So recommendations moving forward. Um, obviously, we want in-person Summer Learning Academy for our Senate bill students in the future um, for math credit recovery. We, we feel it's important to have in-person options. We definitely want to return to focused in-person programs for kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth grade transitions. Um, those programs are so important to smooth transitions for these pivotal moments when um, these kind of programs can actually impact students' success, um, even post-secondary, um, when they have smooth transitions to elementary, middle, and high school. And uh, it's also uh, would be uh, really smart to continue to offer both virtual and in-person options to families next summer. Um, to offer those launch enrichment classes. There were a lot of families who appreciated the flexibility of virtual versus the um, schedule of summer school and having, um, you know, if they had different plans over the summer or the student had different activities that they wanted to do that didn't exactly fit with the summer school schedule, those, those families really liked the flexibility that um, summer virtual classes could provide their elementary and middle school students. So I would recommend based on this that we continue to offer those in addition to in-person enrichment experiences for K through eight and um, the usual in-person summer learning academy that we've offered in the past. And that is the summary. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, so this is an action item. Can I get a motion to um, approve the virtual summer 
Learning Academy evaluation as presented. So Motion. moved, Bellows. Second by Suda. Okay. Is there any discussion or questions? Joanne? I just wanted to thank you for all of the work that it took to pivot to this, um, this virtual learning. Um, it looks like a really strong program and a really good effort with a lot of good outcomes. Thank you for all of the, all the data points. Yeah, it was definitely a, a team effort. There were so many um, great people at the table from the teacher leaders and the teachers who were on board that made this a success, um, even though it was something we hadn't done before. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other comments or questions? I do. Um, so one thing that I'm noticing is that within this data, I think um, the equity issue kind of starts to show, um, especially considering that we had so many kids from certain schools <clears throat> kind of missing in action and that we, we had a hard time engaging them virtually. I, I think it really, there, there's a data point in there that we can see where you know some kids are thriving and some aren't, and so we, you know, hopefully we will be able to give options that close that gap as we go forward. So, um, just making that point. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing this presentation with us. Um, we'll move on to item 7.4, 2020-2021 uh, Professional Development Manual. Point of order, do we need to vote on the last? We do. I'm so sorry. I missed that. Okay. Sorry. We'll vote first. Uh, George? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Aye. All right, sorry about that. Now we'll move on to item 7.4, 2020-2021 Professional Development Manual. Dr. Buchanan? Good evening, board. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the school year 2020-2021 PD Manual as presented. Um, um, a, a month or so ago, we did talk through the professional development journey and um, this is um, just um, a more detailed explanation about our work. And we're more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, this is an action item. Can I get a motion to approve the uh, school year 2020-2021 professional development manual as presented? So moved, Leonard. Second, more. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. There's no questions or comments. Uh, we'll vote. George? Aye. Uh, Tracy? Aye. Joanne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Aye. Item 7.5, 2020 annual election. This is an action um, item. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying this is an action item. So it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the April 6, 2021 general resolution as presented. So um, this is a normal procedure that we have with um, every year for board election. I'm not gonna read all of the content here. I'll just highlight the dates. It is required by um, statute that we um, do approve the election, which will take place on Tuesday, April 6, 2021. Um, we will have two board members to serve for a three-year term at that election. Um, the election timeline is outlined in our board policy, BBB. Um, the first day for five, as well as um, ballot placement, um, board policy AF2 and board policy BBBA for orientation and BCA board organizational meeting. The first day for filing for the April um, 6, 2021 election is December 15th, 2020 from 8 a.m. to 4 30 p.m. And the closing date is January 19th, 2021 
from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. This information will be made available on the district's website. Also, the district does have some days off for winter break and those dates will be included in that um, posting as well. So I am recommending that the board approve the process for the April 6, 2021 election. Can I get a motion to approve the resolution for the April 6, 2020 general election as presented? So moved. Second, second Bellows. Board. Okay, second Bellows. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, uh, George. Aye. Uh, Tracy. Aye. Joanne. Aye. Laverne. Aye. Matt. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Aye. Okay, we'll move on to item eight, board member reports, item 8.1. Uh, Missouri Amendment 3 resolution. So, um, amendment, there's a, uh, we're, we have a amendment coming up um, on the November ballot, which is Missouri Amendment 3. I think, uh, Joanne, you said that you would read the, uh, the resolution. The yes, resolution. I'd like to make a motion to adopt an amended resolution um, that I will now read, which, um, which, indicates our board is in support of Ms. that we, um, no, sorry, let, I strike that from the record. I said the wrong thing. I'm trying to read and talk. Let me just talk. <laughs> um, saying that we would like to point out some of the nuances of Missouri Amendment 3. And I'll there, I'll thus read what is what is written here as a proposed resolution. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Brenner for um, all of her work on this. Um, so resolution, Missouri Amendment 3. Whereas a general election is scheduled in the state of Missouri for November 3rd, 2020. Whereas the ballot includes Amendment 3, which proposes certain changes to the Missouri Constitution related to redistricting for determining representation in the Missouri House of Representatives. And whereas the Board of Education believes those changes could negatively impact fair representation of the school district of university city's interests and the interests of its students. Now, therefore, be it resolved. The Board of Education for the school district of university city hereby expresses its concerns about Missouri Amendment 3, specifically the proposed language that provides that the state house of representative and state senate districts shall be drawn on the basis of one person, one vote. The United States of America's Constitution and the state of Missouri have always counted all people, including children, in a geographic area when determining equal representation. The language one person, one vote may be utilized by the Missouri state government to only include voting age citizens when determining quote unquote equal representation for state officials. The Board of Education believes that by potentially excluding children under 18 from these calculations, representation of children and subsequently their needs will be diminished. In addition, since this meth method of establishing one person, one vote potentially decreases the representation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, redrawn state district boundary lines may decrease the number of state representatives serving the university city community and thus representing the interests of the district and its students. And that concludes the um, the proposed amended resolution. So did we back off of what we were saying? Then? No, not really. I, I think it was just, um, so the concern is that um, if we are too outright about our support for any type of ballot initiative, then we are or could be um, violating that policy that says we shouldn't be using district resources. So this is just, uh, we are expressing our concern for issues that are in that and still giving people, I guess, the autonomy to make their own decisions. And we're just saying collectively as a board, uh, these are the concerns that we feel will impact uh, the people that we represent. Um, so we're, it says a lot of the same things. It just kind of backs off of um, supporting, um, or I'm sorry, excuse me, opposing um, that amendment three. Okay. So, so we did, we did back off of it, I guess. 
and so, um, okay. yeah, Joanne. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I had concerns about um, actually supporting, about actually um, opposing the amendment. And so um, the couple of changes that I'm recommending are changing. It used to, it, it originally said opposing Amendment 3. I'm proposing changing it to Missouri Amendment 3 as our resolution. It originally said that we expressed opposition to um, Missouri Amendment 3. I'm proposing that we change it to expresses concern about Missouri Amendment 3. And then um, striking an area where we say the board is opposed to proposed language and just saying specifically that proposed language. And then finally, simply removing um, the, the stronger language of opposing Amendment 3 on November 3rd at the end of the resolution. I think it's a very fine resolution, but we're trying to walk that line. I'm, try, I'm proposing that we walk the line um, a little bit inside of outwardly um, opposing. Yeah, so we backed off of it, essentially. I mean, we're, we're saying, I, no, it's fine. My, I, I, I do have one concern because I'm seeing it happen within here. I want to be clear that um, we have, so people keep saying support, oppose, and oppose would be the right direction for our concerns and we're not being as clear about that and by taking that language out and so i just want to point that out that we've actually done that within our own discussion here and getting very confused about that so um but that's my only concern but i will support whatever the major majority would like so yeah i i wanted to speak up real quick so i i reread the original um resolution re and then I reread the legal representation and or their their interpretation and I feel like they're saying the original one is okay that we can we can give a resolution that opposes an amendment that we know is bad for our community um, so you know I, I, I actually I, I like the strong language saying that we oppose this as a board because legal has confirmed after reading it themselves that we are not in violation of that that statute in any way um, because we are not campaigning we are not using funds we are simply putting out a resolution i mean some people may disagree but legal doesn't and they're the ones that uh they're the ones that represent us if it, it in, in a legal matter And yeah, I, I hear that. And I'm just um, just throwing this out there. I think there is also just maybe some concerns that um, we because we get our policy from MSBA. Um, and I don't know if we uh, even had a chance, Lisa, to, uh, you know, even I know we said that we we're gonna have Michelle look at it, but I know I thought we were also gonna have MSBA look at it. And I don't know if we had that opportunity. So I think maybe, um, maybe that might, and Joanne, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe that's um, some of the um, apprehension behind including some of the strong language. Um, I'm open to either. I do understand the, uh, the concern of not wanting to uh, put that out there with the support if it would be in violation of some policy. So I don't know. Feels kind of weird. <laughs> So. I like it better. I like it better uh, as Joanne has uh, changed it personally, for what it's worth. Can you expound upon that a little bit more, George? Um, I think it, it's been said. Um, uh, I was a little bit uncomfortable with the thought that we're actually kind of telling people how to vote, and I like it better as simply expression of concern and an informational item really for, for people that for the public that um, this is this is an amendment that has a lot of stuff in it and um, it's a bit of a um, Trojan horse. It, 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 it is kind of sometimes these amendments by the time they um, you know they go through a process where the language we see on the ballot is sometimes is fought over and it's not the full language of what actually is being enacted. It's a whole process of 
that can be challenged as to what the summary is that goes on the ballot. So the, the, these resolutions um, can be tricky. And um, I think we're just offering, I, I'm more comfortable just offering clarification of our understanding and our concern that it, 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 it has something in it that sounds very innocuous, one person, one vote, but we're not making this up. We, other people have expressed concern that that could really be a Trojan horse for changing the districting in a manner that hurts, hurts us. And um, I think that's enough, enough said there. Thank you, George. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Laverne, did you have anything to add? You're muted. Hey, Chris, Chris, okay. I don't really have anything to add. I think that it might not be a bad idea to consult with MSBA if we haven't done it. Yeah, I think, um, I think the issue uh, at this point really is time. Um, because, well, I mean, we only have, you know, if we're going to pass it as a board, we wouldn't have a lot of time before the election. So I think that's, um, what that's, I think that's why we're here now. And, um, and to that point, I think that it might be better if we're not sure and we haven't, um, had that second opinion or, you know, just second consultation. Uh, maybe we do just leave it with the language that, um, Joanne has proposed. That would be my suggestion. I'm fine with voting on that if we want to do that now. Point of order, you need a second. Joanne has a motion. I'll second it. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Okay. Uh, George? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Uh, Laverne? Uh, aye. Joanne? Aye. Matt? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're going to go with the proposed language that uh, Joanne uh, read for us into the minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 8.2, board member reports. Um, so we, uh, we will provide some uh, updates from our activities and liaison um, roles. I'll start with uh, Joanne. Yes, um, I attended the um, virtual uh, high school PTO meeting last night. Um, and uh, Principal Peoples indicates that students are adapting well to distance learning. Um, of course, they're wanting to get back to in-person, but understand the safety of our students is paramount. Um, there was pretty good feedback on parent-teacher conferences. They were held virtually. Um, a lot of families liked being able to set an appointment and have um, a set amount of time with their children's teachers. There were a couple of people who said the schedule was full before they got there, though, uh, before they got there. So they're working on um, working out those kinks. And then um, the ACT dates have been extended and dates have been added um, so that students can take the ACT in a socially distanced um, environment. So that's all I have there. Thanks. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Laverne? I think you are saying nothing. Pass. Okay, pass. Pass. Tracy? Excuse me, um, just the um, meeting with the policy committee with you and Lisa and um, meeting the two students from WashU that are going to be um, doing their fellowship with us. And that was a really great experience. And so that's pretty much all I have. Thank you, George. Yeah, you know, um, Dr. Harden Bartley mentioned the Friday night in the stadium with the student documentaries and uh, uh, I was there for the whole thing, um, except for I didn't. I left before before they announced who won. But um, uh, 
I, this, this work was really good. Um, it kept my attention for, it was maybe a couple hours. Um, and um, uh, these students not only did a fine job of, of putting together multimedia presentations from a kind of a technical standpoint, right? Um, but um, uh, they really took on some very interesting topics. I, I don't want to go through all of them, but I will say that uh, uh, they were all, um, you know, provocative. And um, some of them were things that, uh, you know, I've thought about myself for years and years and years of, of living here and being here. And um, these kids were, you know, observing what's going on in their community and the larger community, the county, and um, questioning and boldly questioning. Um, and uh, others were boldly criticizing. And uh, so it was a wonderful thing. And I am glad to hear that I think it was said that we we bought the the screen so we can do more outdoor presentations. Um, in any case, um, that uh, opportunity of, um, you know, showing visual, audio visual on a large screen um, outdoors is something that may be uh, useful um, to supplement the, the hybrid that we're doing because it's something that students can do outdoors, which is more more safe uh, way to gather. Um, so uh, all in all, that was a, a very good experience for me. I was very proud of the students. So George, UCEF um, purchased the screen and the projector. Yeah, that's um, So I want to make sure we give them the credit and we can use it for other things. And they were very supportive of uh, Mrs. Snead and her students. Sure, OK, good, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, George. Uh, Matt? Uh, yeah, I also attended uh, that uh, Friday night um, screening of the documentaries. And I, I just wanted to echo what George said. I was just super impressed with with what the, what the kids put together. Um, again, they're all very thought provoking, topical. And like George said, they asked a lot of uncomfortable questions. Um, um, and they, you know, to uh, to not only their peers, but to the parents of their peers, uh, which I thought was really impressive to be doing that at, at a high school age to answer, ask those kind of questions. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't stay till the end. Um, benches are not the greatest thing for a woman or a, or a woman who is eight months pregnant. So we had to leave a little early, but uh, it was it was great and, and just a great use of the resources that we have. Um, so I was I was very impressed by by that night. Thank you, Matt, and congratulations. Didn't know that. Um, <laughs> so that's good news, too. Good news all around. Um, and Lisa. Um, don't have much more to add. Uh, uh, Tracy mentioned um, the policy committee, and we're moving forward with um, equity, the equity policy. Hopefully, we'll get that to you by the beginning of the year sometime <clears throat> is kind of the timeline I kind of see, maybe January. Um, and then also we haven't really mentioned because um, we haven't had board reports since then that we had msba and you know it was disappointing not to be able to um, do some one-on-one -on -one talking with other board members so much but at the same time i did get some things out of it and i really did enjoy um i think the thing i enjoyed most which which was the closest to one-on-one -on -one, was the um uh, the district meetings that we had um, and just listening to other people and what they were going through with COVID-19 and, and hearing other perspectives um, in Kansas City and St. Louis. But other than that, I don't have anything else. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa. I was uh, I am part of the policy committee, and I just want to um, commend that committee for the work that's coming out of that because I think there's a lot of amazing things that we're doing with policy committee. And so I just wanted to say that um, I really appreciate that, and to um, have been able to be a part of that journey, especially with the equity 
policy that we're working on. So I want to thank all the, the members, past and present, uh, for policy committee. Um, thank you for the MSBA, because I was going to mention that too, so I won't get into that. I did do agree with you, Lisa, that um, the virtual aspect really lacks um, a lot of the um, interpersonal things that we're able to do and accomplish at um, MSBA. And I mean that even from like an interpersonal um, relationship with our board, because that's really the, the place uh, where we all get to bond, especially when we have new members. Um, and I think the other thing um, that's going on that I'm working with is I'm working with uh, Janet Tilly and some other board members around uh, diversity on our boards. I don't know if I've mentioned that before. Um, we met before. Uh, we met once recently um, just to kind of talk about like what it means um, to have uh, a diverse group of people running uh, for school board. Uh, we had someone and his name escapes me right now from Kansas City who is like one of the only Latin um, representatives um, in his area. And so we see that as an opportunity to um, really have uh, diversity um, throughout the Missouri region. Um, and so we're the, I think our next step is really working on um, telling our stories of how we came to the board and that will be uh, out there for um, I guess other people to see as they're considering like running for the board. So we have um, folks from Kansas City, uh, we have folks from Springfield. So uh, it's a really interesting committee and so I'm excited to see what comes out of that. And that's all for me. So uh, 9.1, uh, our upcoming meetings, Matt Bellows. Yeah, November 5th, we have a board work session at 5.45 p.m. And then November 19th, uh, we have a regular board meeting at 7 p.m. Thank you. So item 9.2, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion by Suda. Second by Moore. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All right, Lisa? Aye. Matt? Aye. Joanne? Aye. George? Aye. Gracie? Aye. Laverne? Aye. Aye. Good night, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.